What's up, everybody? This is Cage Limited, and today we are back with episode 12 of Spill the Tea Roll, a JRPG podcast where we go over some JRPG news, releases, mechanics, what I've been playing, want to play, and more. And this is kind of a special episode for me internally because I, I believe I mentioned this either in one of the episodes or I might have mentioned this in my Final Fantasy Let's Play. But when I started this podcast, the intent was to do it at least for three months and see how it goes from there so like there was no guarantee that i was gonna continue after that it was just like just at least do it for three months you know commit to some of it and then we'll see from there where we want to go and uh, three months if you know how to do math weekly episodes means 12 episodes so do 12 episodes and see how it goes so this is the 12th episode so this is the episode where i would pretty much stop and think like do i still want to do this is it worth it am i getting the viewership that would make sense for this to continue and so far i think the answer is yes for me i think everything's going good this actually has become a highlight of my week where i actually legitimately enjoy you know planning the podcast and recording it and even doing the light editing and posting it up it's like legitimately enjoyable even though like as like during my work i edit like almost like seven to ten videos a week not even counting this i still enjoy doing this one specifically and so i am going to continue doing it and it does get some views it gets some audio listeners too so i do want to continue so that is something i want to mention because episode 12 for me internally was like a very important number to actually hit and the fact that we actually hit it and i do want to keep going is a really good sign so we're going to be doing that which is very good i still want to figure out like how you're supposed to like brand podcast properly in terms of like i've seen other podcasts have like their own social media accounts like their own twitters and stuff i don't know how that works i have a cage limited twitter but i don't go too much on it mainly because like the people i follow like will understandably like post stuff about games that i like so like the post final fantasy rebirth stuff or like if there's kingdom hearts stuff they'll post about that but like i don't like following stuff that i like due to spoilers so like i love the trails games i don't consume anything trails really on the internet because i don't want spoilers I love One Piece. I don't follow anything One Piece related, so I don't get spoilers. So I can't really use a Cage Limited account to like consume stuff. I only use it if I want to tweet once in a while and because I don't really use it to consume, I don't end up tweeting. So like maybe making a spill the Tiro Twitter account is the move so like I can kind of restart a following for this channel because spill the Tiro is kind of the main thing of this channel right now. And so like maybe that's something I'll think about doing because that would maybe be a good idea especially because i am thinking of continuing it now and hopefully getting more serious with it even though i have been serious about it nothing's really changing content wise but yeah that is uh one thing i want to mention another thing i actually really want to mention is i i, I this happened last week but i didn't mention it but spill the tear roll has officially surpassed shot lock in terms of episode count which is pretty cool too shot locked was i believe 10 episodes and i believe seven of those episodes were from like years ago and i recently came back and did like three more episodes kind of sporadically and so the fact that uh spill the tear roll i surpassed shot locked episodes and there was no dropped week or anything and i was able to do it continuously i think is really cool and is is nice because i do i believe enjoy doing this podcast more than shot locked personally because I love Kingdom Hearts, but like the my mood with Kingdom Hearts kind of sways. Like as with everything, like I can love even like with Trails. I fucking love Trails, but I'm I'm not actively playing it right now, even though like I'm in the middle of one. And so like I kind of like ebb and flow with the things I like. And trying to do a Kingdom Hearts podcast continuously, especially when there's no news, is very hard. And with JRPGs, it's just it's perfect because like pretty much every game I play personally is a JRPG. And what's been really cool about this podcast is actually it has gotten me to get to know more jrpgs that i didn't know about and i'll be talking about that in my what i'm playing section because i'm playing a jrpg which like i probably would have never tried but i am playing it because i want to try but also because i knew i'll be able to talk about it on this podcast and i will talk about it in this episode so that's super cool too so yeah i just want to mention that with episode 11 we surpassed shot lock now with episode 12 we're kind of breezing by shot lock which is pretty cool and yeah and i'm i was thinking about like whether shot lock would ever come back as a full podcast because it is Kingdom Hearts focused and obviously it's its own thing and it kind of needs Kingdom Hearts news for it to be a thing. Obviously there were other segments, but the more I think about it, I'm like, it would make more sense if I just talk about the Kingdom Hearts stuff here. So this Kingdom Hearts news, I'll talk about it and spill the tarot and things like that. So like I, as of now, I don't think it'll come back, but we will see. So yeah, that's just kind of where I'm at with Shaw Locked and how this is surpassing it in my opinion. Yeah, so like I mentioned last episode, I do want to do the thing where I kind of like show something I have. And I thought something that'd be fun is to like recommend a book. So this is a book that I got. Let me just turn off the auto tracking. It's called The Tunnel to Summer. The the Exit of Goodbyes. I'm showing the cover. For audio listeners, it just shows like a girl like standing 
on like a beach and like a beautiful sky behind her and uh this was a book i got it like a year ago when i read it this is a book that i read and i really loved and what's nice is it's technically a light novel i honestly wouldn't wouldn't have known it was a light novel because i don't really know what light novels are but from my understanding light novels are pretty much just like the way mangas are predecessors to anime light novels are kind of the predecessor to mangas in some ways and so it's pretty much like if you like the plot of anime or manga and like the, that type of storytelling which i do light novels are pretty much those but written like as a book so it's like it's just straight up like it's just like words so it's a book and i really love this one it's written by mei hachimoku and what's dope is this is like a pretty like newish writer from what i can tell i think she's she might be my age or younger than me which is surprising and um I, but at the time I bought this, she only had two books, this one and there's another one that I have on my shelf there. But what's, what's really funny is I was just going to talk about this um, in this episode a bit, just to recommend it. But I literally saw a tweet like 30 minutes before I started recording and her next book is coming out uh, soon to the West. Um, I think it's called like the Mimosa something, but like, yeah, I'm probably going to be picking that up too once I read the second one. But just to recommend it in case uh, you are interested, uh, basic plot, um, I'm not going to spoil anything, but the, it's called The Tunnel to Summer, and that's because the entire plot revolves around a tunnel that the main characters find, and they find out that when you go into it, it's kind of like the hyperbolic time chamber where time actually runs differently in the tunnel compared to outside. So I can't remember exactly what it was, but for example, you may go in the tunnel for five minutes, and when you come outside, a week might have passed, something like that. And what's funny is they actually do compare it to the hyperbolic time chamber in the book, like the character literally says, this is just like the hyperbolic time chamber. And uh, one of the things I'll mention, which is why I really like this book specifically is because they're very realistic about it where like in a lot of anime or manga sometimes you might have like say they found something like this in some anime they maybe just might jump right in and try to explore it and figure out like what it is but the issue with that is it's very fucking risky because like if you just went in and you didn't know what the time dilation was and you come out there's a chance that like 500 years could have passed and you would have been fucked because your family and friends are all dead but what i really love about this specifically is that the main characters the first thing they do when they find the tunnel is that they run experiments to find out what the dilation is so they do experiments with like string and measurements and try to figure out like what it is and they literally write down to the second what the time dilation is and only after that do they actually start going to the tunnel and exploring so that was a little aspect that when it happened i'm like like, okay yep this book is for me because it's more realistic than kind of like the stupid nature of some anime where like they might have just jumped into it and just like started exploring where that would be very risky so yeah the tunnel to summer the exit of goodbyes is very good i believe there's a manga version too if you're more into that but yeah i really recommend it it's very good and yeah i just want to really show that off because it's, i kind of have fun recommending and showing stuff that i have in this podcast so that is what it is other than that we'll get the podcast started by showing another spirited away ghibli card and this week we have i'll pick a random card i got the exact same one as last week that's insane i'm not gonna show that one again that's wild i just randomly cut it okay okay this time we have the six of hearts it is pretty much two weird looking shopkeepers they have like wide faces they kind of look like toads to be honest one has a mustache well actually both of them have a mustache one of them is smiling but yeah we will start on that note and also one last thing before we start i think i'm gonna predict this episode is gonna be packed as fuck because every segment i have has a lot of stuff i get to cover so this may be the longest episode in a while i'm not sure maybe i'll like cut stuff on the fly if it's getting too long but there's a lot in this episode so it's gonna be more exciting than usual so hopefully you enjoy so let's get to our first segment which is what i've been playing now for what i've been playing there is one game that i've been playing i What's funny is, if you asked me last week whether there was a chance that I'd be talking about this, there would be zero chance because I literally did not even really know the game last week. It's just that I happened to be playing it. I have heard of it, but I knew nothing about it. And the game is Golden Sun. Now, if you're familiar with it, you may be wondering, like, why the hell am I playing it? It is a Game Boy game, and it I checked it released in 2001. And the reason I'm playing it, and if you haven't heard, I'm not sure, like, why you might have not heard it, because it's actually a big, like, point of discussion right now, but um, the iOS App Store, they recently um, had Delta put onto it. If you don't know what Delta is, it's funny. I used to use this, like, when I was, like, I want to say, like, in high school maybe even younger that is an emulator you get on your phone and you can play game boy games and nintendo ds games i think you play n64 games and because there's been like a lot of legal changes with the app store delta was able to be put onto the app store and now so you could legally emulate nintendo games now on it so which is awesome so you before i used to have to jailbreak uh, my phone i remember the first time and the only time i played pokemon emerald which is my po favorite pokemon game was through delta when i was in high school I, I just played the entire thing on my iphone so it was kind of cool seeing that i can just get it like legally very easily without having to jailbreak anything 
So I got Delta, and when I got it, uh, usually what I did with emulators, like when I was younger, is I used to play Pokemon. That was like the only thing I played because any other game of the era I wasn't really interested in. But at this point, I know that I like JRPGs, so I googled JRPGs on the Game Boy. I saw Golden Sun, and Golden Sun was a game that I've heard about, like I've heard the name, but I literally don't know, no, don't know anything else about it. And so I looked into it. Apparently, there's two games on the Game Boy, one game on the DS. So I'm like, it's like a trilogy, probably doesn't seem too long. So I'm like, let me try it out. I got the first Golden Sun. It's on the Game Boy. I downloaded it through certain means i'm not sure how i downloaded it just ended up in my iphone legally i must say that and it's it's a really good game so i played it i don't know how long exactly i played it because i play it like here and there i want to say between two to four hours maybe maybe even a bit more but damn is it a very good game and i want to say like i'm so surprised that there's games from the game boy era that looks so fucking beautiful to me because I, I mentioned this when I had the discussion on a previous episode about Final Fantasy 4 where I'm like, yo, this game looks really fucking good. This is like a really good looking game and I'm assuming Final Fantasy 4 is an older game than 2001 and that that looked that game looked good and I really liked it and it was like, you know, a pixely game. This game's graphics like blow that out of the water. Like it looks fucking beautiful. The sprites are beautiful. Um, a lot of the sprites are like very rounded. It's not like very like grid based and square. Like you'll have cabinets and bookshelves which are kind of like off kilter and things like that. The battles, visually, <laughs> honestly, they look better than some turn-based games today. It's pretty much like a camera view from behind the characters. And once you start attacking the enemies, they have a beautiful animation. And even though it's 2D, they use parallax in a way where it looks like it's cinematically panning behind your characters and you're fighting the enemies. Like, it looks really fucking cool. Like, uh, if you're listening or watching, like, Google it or YouTube it and see how, like, a battle looks like. It looks very nice. The animations look beautiful. Like, visually, like, it's blowing my mind. Like, straight up visually, it looks better than many modern JRPGs, in my opinion. I was like, holy shit. And this is a Game Boy game that came out in 2001. One. so i really liked because of that the battle system is nice it's like this normal jpg battle turn-based system where like you get an attack they have like a system in this called i don't know if it's pronounced synergy or synergy it's psy the energy as an energy um i'm assuming it's synergy because probably like psychokinesis or some shit plus uh, synergy or plus energy but synergy is easier to say so i'm just gonna say synergy and so it's just kind of like powers the random powers like the main character can move shit you can like have earthquake moves fire moves shit like that so it's pretty much like the magic system of this of this world and so far it's been really good again this just really looks nice and the reason i played jrpg is because of the story and the story has been pretty interesting the intro of the game was really fucking good like a lot better than it had any right to being because i guess I, okay, for the next, like, minute, I'll say the intro. It's, like, the first, like, hour of the game, so I don't even know if, if I consider the spoils because it's the first hour, so, like, if you really don't want to listen to it, skip a minute. If not, I'm just going to talk about, like, literally the intro of the game. So, in the intro, you play as a kid. Your name is Isaac. You have a friend named Garrett. And there's... You have another friend. I cannot remember her name, unfortunately, right now. I believe it was Jenna or something like that. And pretty much the whole intro is you're trying to, like, get to safety because there's a, there's a volcano or something in this town and a boulder is about to fall off it and kind of, like, you know, like, crush you or something. And so you're trying to escape and while you're escaping you find out jenna and a lot of people are huddled around her house because jenna's little brother felix is in the river he's stuck and he's holding on and he's about to drown and the boulders are gonna maybe come and like hit them so you're trying to pretty much help them out find someone who has enough synergy to help them you go around town find someone get back but as you get back and try to help them a boulder comes crushes everyone that was on the bridge and felix and they all just like die and then like a time skips to like a bit more in the future and you're slightly older and that's how the game begins so when that intro happened, I was like, holy fuck, <laughs> this is so much more serious than I thought. Because I'm like, yeah, this is like a Game Boy game, it's gonna be like fun, yeah, whatever. But when I started like that, I'm like, okay, they're serious. Like straight up just started with like, yeah, like people died. I believe Jenna's parents are dead. Like she's just kind of like an orphan now. She lives with her grandparents. So I'm like, that's a pretty cool intro. And I was hooked since then. And since then, I played a bit more. I I explored the town, did a few more plot things there of like um visiting the the volcano. I believe it's called the Soul Sanctum or something. Which like it's the game is about like alchemy and like the truth behind alchemy, which I love because I love Full Metal Alchemist. So like there was a plot with that. Uh, you're now like kind of exploring uh the town because you fucked up the world by exploring the Soul Sanctum. And so I'm already in the second town, and I believe I'm done the plot of the second town too. So I have to go somewhere else too. And so yeah, it's been really nice. It is an older game, so I actually had to like. When I left the first town and I was in the overworld, I did have to Google after a while, like, where the fuck do I have to go? Because games like this that have overworlds, like, it's kind of confusing where you can go because, like, you can go somewhere, so much places. So, like, I had to go to a certain town and I had gone into the town. I just didn't know what to do. But there was, like, three other, like, or four other locations that I could have also gone to, which I didn't know, like, which location was the right one. So I just Googled and I found out what town I had to go to. And, yeah, just, like, overall, I'm not really a fan of overworlds in games. That's, like, a thing that, like, whenever I see I'm like, eh, I don't really like that. But that is, like 
a sign of like past games and that's not really done that much anymore but like yeah when the, when i got to the overworld i was like eh, i don't really like this that much but like it was fine it wasn't that hard to get to the next location but yeah i just really like golden sun i'm not even sure there's anything else to say i really just wanted to mention the visuals because the visuals is are uh, really beautiful i'm just looking at my notes is anything else cool i guess one more thing i can mention which is like a small like mechanic thing which i really like because i saw this game do it and for some reason i've never seen any other jrpg that i've played do it which is, uh, is it's weird because it's a quality of life thing and the reason it's weird is because usually when I go to a past JRPG, they are like the opposite of quality of life. It's just like annoying to play them usually. But this is a quality of life thing that I wish like modern games had, which maybe they do have and I don't know. And that is, I was in a store and I bought a sword for my main character. And usually everyone knows the sloper. You buy a sword, you then usually have to get out, put it on your character, and then you have to go back to the store and you can sell your old one. And usually what ends up happening is that like games usually have the option that it auto equips your main character, which I like. But usually what ends up happening is that you got to sell your weapon manually. Or what I do is I usually just forget to sell it. And then I just sell it at some point in the game when I need money. What this game did is that the store owner's like, hey, here's a sword. He's like, can I, should I switch it for you? You say, yeah. Then he's like, oh, your, your old sword. Uh, I can buy it off you for like 500 gold. Do you want to sell it to me right now? You press yes and it's done. Everything is automated. So like when you buy a weapon, you get it automatically. It equips it if you want it and automatically you can sell your old weapon if you want it. It's such a cool little feature where I'm like, why the fuck aren't games doing that now? Like, I would love that. And yeah, when I saw that, I'm like, hell yes. And yeah, it works with every party member, like with armor, what, what, what have you. It was like, when I saw that feature, I was like, hell yeah, that's something I hopefully can see more in future JRPGs. But I just don't think I've ever seen that in any other modern JRPG that I've played. So that was like a small thing that I noticed where I'm like, yeah, Golden Sun is like a very good game, which uh, with a lot of modern mechanics, I don't really see in modern times. But yeah, that's uh, the only game that I've been playing. Uh, like I mentioned last week, I beat Crisis Core and I still have not played Final Fantasy VII Remake since I've last played it. So hopefully I'll play that more and talk about that next week. But I think I will be playing more Golden Sun because the, the best part, part is it's on my phone. So I can just play whenever I want. It's literally the 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 way to play with the least resistance. I would say the one with most resistance is like PC, where you have to kind of get onto your PC and your chair. One better, more convenient is like a console, because you could like kind of sit on your couch. One better is like a handheld console, like a Switch or like a Portal or a Steam Deck. But the best one is your phone, because like you can literally pull that out anytime. Like I'm okay with just like pulling out and playing Golden Sun for like 20 minutes and putting it away. Whereas I probably won't do that with my PS5. So I'll probably be playing some more Golden Sun before next week too and talking about it more there. But yeah, that's pretty much what I've been playing. And from there, we'll move on to our next segment, which is a JRPG that I'm looking forward to. Now, the JRPG that I'm looking forward to that I think is pretty dope. Now, what's funny is I've been seeing this game in my YouTube recommended a lot. Like I've seen videos talking about it. And I, I was seeing it so much where I'm like, okay, what the fuck is this game? And this game is called Wuthering Waves. And what's funny is the more I look into it, I think this is probably a game that I probably would have seen on like an Instagram ad um, for those curious. Like the way I found out about Genshin Impact, the way I found out about um, Tower of Fantasy, the way I found out about Honkai Star Rail, they were, they were all from like Instagram ads. So I kind of have this thing where like, whenever I see like an anime type game from an Instagram ad, I'm like, okay, it's probably like a Genshin Impact esque game. And um, I'm assuming this is the type of game that it would be like that that I would see an Instagram ad on because it is very much like Genshin Impact. It's a beautiful looking game. If you Google Wuthering Waves and look at some gameplay, like it looks just like Genshin Impact, like visually. I'll say animation wise, the term the that the, uh, amount of polish it has too. It looks like Genshin Impact too, which I think Genshin Impact is probably one of the more polished games that I've seen. And so this is a JRPG I'm looking forward to because it honestly looks cool to me and something that I would love to try. And I'm assuming it's like Genshin Impact where it'd be like free because it's coming out on mobile, PS5 and PS4. And I have the logline here of the plot, which I'll read really quick, which is the story in Wuthering Waves is set after the calamity known as the Calamon to raise the world of almost all human life. Desperate to survive, the survivors forged uneasy alliances to rebuild some semblance of civilization from its ruins. And I got that from uh, game co. And so the plot seems pretty, you know, standard JRPG plot, but it seems pretty cool because honestly, like Genshin Impact, I like the game. I just fell off at some point because I remember me and my brother were playing it for the sole purpose of unlocking co-op so we could play together. And then when we finally got there and found out the co-op is kind of shit in Genshin, we kind of fell off, even though I know the Genshin game is good. And at some point when I want to get back, Genshin was just so deep into its plot and updates where like, I was just very confused and I was trying to play it. So I kind of fell off. Tower of Fantasy, when that came out, I tried playing it. I actually really liked it. I really liked the characters, like, right out the bat. The kind of female character that's there and, like, the entire town. I really like their personalities and I really enjoy the setting. 
and I really liked the environment too. But the issue was like it was a very broken game. Like it was very like rough feeling. It was not polished like Genshin. I was playing it on my phone. I tried attaching a controller and that worked, but like some things wouldn't work. So if I want to talk to some people, X wouldn't work, and I would have to press the screen even though I'm using the controller. So like it would be very little uh, weird things like that. And at some point, it was buggy enough where I said I would wait for it. And um, flash forward, Tower Fantasy did come out on uh, PlayStation, but I think people said it was still broken, so I just still haven't played it again. And now we have Wuthering Waves, which apparently is um, kind of similar. Uh, one thing that I like about Wuthering Waves, which is not like Tower Fantasy, is, at least based on the trailers, it looks polished. Like, it doesn't look like rough as Tower Fantasy did. It looks pretty. It looks legit like pretty much like uh, what I imagine Genshin Impact to look like. It looks a lot more like, um, I believe it's Zenless Zone Zero, like the more like urban game where like you have characters, like one of the characters of the gameplay I watched like, was using pistols and it was very fast-paced combat. You can switch on the fly with characters to fight. Now they're fighting like multiple walls. It looked really cool visually. It's really nice gameplay wise. It looks really fun. The environments look nice and vibrant and like they look like they're um, fun to explore. In the gameplay, they were also doing this cool maneuver to um, move around, which is like this air grapple thing. It was very similar to in um, Monster Hunter Rise, I believe. You kind of have this uh, mechanic where you can kind of grapple the air and then kind of like just keep grappling like that. And so I saw that in this gameplay where like, yeah, the characters were just straight up grappling onto the air and pulling themselves forward. So I'm assuming that's a way that you can traverse in this game, which was uh, very nice. And yeah, that's pretty much all that I have to mention. In terms of like UI, it looks like pretty simple. There's like a mini map and it looked very Genshin Impact. There was a mini map. There was like the three characters on the right, which is like the party members. And that, the, the UI, I would say, could use a bit more tuning up. It looked very mobile where like the text font it was very basic. Uh, th what's weird is like... So usually mobile games have like large UI because you're playing on your phone. But there was some UI that was very huge, understandably because of the mobile game, but some that was small. So like when they're in the pause menu, a lot of the text was very big. So I'm like, yeah, this is clearly a, mo a mobile game. But when they're in the gameplay mode, the mini map was like very fucking small. And I mean like very small. Like if I was playing like even like on a big phone, like I have a um, iPhone 15 Pro Max. Like if I was playing on this, a mini map would probably be like half an inch big on a big phone which is pretty tiny and so like on a smaller phone like the mini map would be like almost useless so i thought that was funny how some of the ui elements of the game looked very small while some looked very big and i wasn't clear what platform they were playing it on but that didn't really matter because some were, some ui elements were big and some were small so hopefully the ui gets a bit more tuning up but yeah that is a game that is coming out on mobile ps5 ps4 it is not out yet um i checked that website and they have like an insane amount of pre-registrations i think it was like 19 million or some shit which seems absolutely wild because usually like a million sales in games are like really good and i know this is free but 19 million pre-registers is fucking wild so yeah we'll see how the game does and if it comes out and is decent i'll try it i probably will try it it's free there's no reason not to try it but i'll probably try it and then talk about my thoughts in uh, Spill the Tiro. But yeah, that is a JRPG I'm looking forward to. And let's move on to our next segment, which is JRPG news that I think is dope. So in this segment, I talk about some JRPG news, any big JRPG news or JRPG news that I just personally find interesting. So one quick thing that I want to get out of the way, which is Kingdom Hearts news, that is uh, there is a Kingdom Hearts missing link beta that is going to be happening. It is kind of disappointing to some, including me, because the North American account tweeted about it, but the beta is not for North America. It is for UK and Australia. So if you're part of those regions, you might as well sign up um i still signed up for it because i didn't know that was only for the uk until the end of the the process where it asked me if i was in the uk or australia and since i was pretty much done and i'm like let me just still apply and see what happens but yeah you just got to fill out a tiny survey it took like a minute and then you are um you've applied to the beta and then i'm assuming it's gonna start rolling out at some point and yeah so there will be a missing link beta it sucks that it's taking so long for it to get out but like whatever a game that's more polished is better at the end of the day but yeah i, I believe it was supposed to be out like, it was supposed to be out a while ago, but we're still not even at a stage where they can do a beta in North America, which is funny. But it's good to know that they at least have an English version since they're doing a beta in the UK and Australia. So it'll be cool to see um, if there's anything that comes out of that. I'm not sure how it works in terms of, like, footage capturing, if that's allowed if you're a beta tester. I don't think it was allowed in the Japanese one. I'm not sure if it'll be different here. But uh, whatever comes out of it, I'll probably cover it on this podcast, so... Yeah, that was the first piece of news. Uh, secondly, there is a game that I want to talk about. This is like, I just I saw it like as a new story that looked kind of cool, which is called Adventure Bar Story, which is now available worldwide for PS5 and PS4, and it launches April 25th for Switch and May 9th for PC. Now, this is a mobile game. So like, when I saw that, it was a mobile game. Okay, let me see. It's probably just some like gotcha type game, which, which to be fair, it is. But the thing that surprised me is at least like from these screenshots I'm looking at, it looks a lot more like a JRPG than I thought. It honestly looks like... It, like honestly it looks like a Game Boy game like it, it like, like when, when, you, when you look at the screenshots it literally looks like a Game Boy emulator where like the art looks very much like sprite art from back in the day uh there's like 
proper like combat grid based combat like a strategy jrpg there is a d-pad to move around there are like stores you can buy stuff from like this does not look like a mobile game in any way to the point where i would have to look into it more but i'm i don't know if this is actually like a new mobile game or if this is just like a remake of an old game that someone's making because this does not look like a modern mobile game at all this literally looks like someone took like a an older game like a game boy or ds era game and just brought it to mobile because that's what it looks like so it looks pretty cool is what i'm saying it's called adventure bar story so like if you're interested in checking it out check it out but yeah i just saw it and it shows at least on the google play store is two dollars fifty cents to buy and there's a light version where they say you can try it just to see if it like runs properly on your phone but yeah from what i can tell it is only um on mobile right now actually no it says right here ps5 ps4 okay so that's cool and it's coming to switch and pc after so yeah adventure bar story if you're interested in in it check it out uh next new story is for lords of the fallen now this is a game that i actually played a lot of in the past i believe i also did like a, a long like five hour live stream of it like with my brother um on this channel so if you want to see how it looks i guess you could check it out on the live tab on my channel but uh, lords of the fallen is like this souls like game but it has a focus on co-op so you could play the entire story with someone so i was playing through it with my brother at some point we fell off because it was kind of getting hard and like we both like didn't have that much time to play but uh, they released a version 1.5 called the master of fate and uh, based on what i read is pretty much like the i don't know if it's a final update but it's pretty much the end of like these regular updates that they were doing weekly and they have a description of it which i'll read real quick pretty much this says the latest new feature the advanced game modifier system places power directly into players hands allowing them to fully customize their game experience using any combination of seven modifiers to make the game easier more difficult or simply a completely new experience every time modifiers include the ability to randomize enemies alter mob density and evil enable a form of permadeath now, when I read this, that's very interesting to me because one of the main complaints I have of Souls games, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I've ranted about this on this podcast, but like, I do not like Souls games because they're really fucking hard and I'm not good at hard games. But more than that, I personally don't like from software as a developer because they're so like adamant in the stance of like we're not gonna do difficulties, we're gonna keep this game non accessible. And I get if you if you're fine with that, but like in my opinion a game should always be accessible to everyone that's the point of game so like i just don't like like them because of that and so seeing lords of the fallen being a souls game and they just went like the opposite direction of being fully accessible you can change whatever you want you make it easier you can make it harder you can change enemy density like that's really fucking cool and honestly i might check it out maybe like me and my brother will get back into it because it's weird because the way they explain it, it seems like it's almost like a sandbox mode but like i want to see like can you do this with the story so like if a boss is very hard can i just be like make the boss slightly easier please or can i half the boss's hp or some shit like it's it sounds very interesting because like if that's what it takes for me and my brother to finish the story might as well like who cares like, i think people especially if it's a single player game where it doesn't affect like multiplayer people you should be able to play any way you want to play and if you can do stuff like that that's pretty dope and especially because this also i make makes the game harder for people so the people who get hard for hard games like this is for them too so yeah it's called the master of fate update and it looks pretty interesting so i'm probably gonna look more into it and see if it's a reason for me and my brother to get back onto it but other than that this is going to be our last new story and i'm going to be covering it for a while because it is for metaphor refantasio which is a jrpg i talked about in a previous episode of how i'm looking forward to it and i mentioned this last week but there was supposed to be a live stream for it where they would be showing a lot of gameplay and talking about it and i believe that happened a couple of days ago and uh the first new story from that is that we have a release date now it's coming out on october 11th 2024 this year so that is cool and they had 30 minutes of gameplay so i want to talk about that now uh just i'm just admitting it fully I, I didn't watch the full 30 minutes i pretty much just kind of skimmed through it just to see like how it is i've i've said this every episode but like i don't usually watch these things because i don't like being spoiled the same as with this and so like i watched it without sound just like on my computer just skimming through it so i don't get any story spoilers but i will talk about like ui visuals combat and things like that so i'm going to be talking about my thoughts on that for the rest of the segment and so the thing that i noticed right off the bat which was fucking beautiful is a ui now obviously persona is known for its cool ass flashy ui and very polished looking cool dope ass <laughs> proper ui i have no other way to explain it but the way the persona games usually looked at it was very poppy ui like a lot of solid colors and patterns and things like that now this game has the same sort of like animations in its ui where like everything kind of like flows properly but the visual style of this game has gone for the ui is like this more sketchy style so from the way the chat boxes look where like the edges are kind of like sketched in chalk and they're kind of animating to look like they're kind of drawn to the mini map where the mini map literally looks like it's sketched in pencil to the shop where the shop literally looks like a blueprint print and like everything is like sketched like i'm in love with the ui it looks freaking beautiful it pretty much has the polish and dopeness and originality of the persona games but it's in a style 
which I think is harder to pull off and looks better in my opinion when compared to the Persona games. And uh, what, you're gonna see a pattern when I'm talking about this, but this to me, as someone who hasn't played too much Persona, I've only played 10 hours of P5, I think this game looks like a better persona for me so this is a game i'm probably gonna try and if i really love it i'll probably you know use this as a gateway to get into the other persona games but yeah ui to me just looked beautiful from the shop to the chat to the mini map etc uh one thing i just noticed i guess i'll this really quick uh there's a fairy with you in the game i don't know why she's there again i just came through it but like uh there are some scenes of you talking with her i believe she uses a spell on you at some point but like yeah you just have like a small fairy literally like a tinkle tinkerbell looking little shit who's like always with you in the game and um in the in the gameplay from what i saw you kind of uh, see this desert area which has a lot of enemies and then you go into a town uh to start with the desert area it was pretty much like a very open area with a bunch of monsters honestly i didn't really like how this looked at least from what i saw because it pretty much looked like a boring big open space to fight bad guys which i don't really like in jrpgs so it was a desert area it was very freaking windy and sandy so you literally could not see anything you could just see the silhouettes of monsters and you pretty much just had to get by the monsters and if you touch one of them you'd have to fight them and that's what that was and i believe at some point of the gameplay something happens where you, can, where you can see in the desert it stops being windy but even then it's like desert areas in games aren't really that fun ever and like same with this it just looks very empty there's a lot of monsters and yeah, that's how it looked like. Obviously, there can be things that you can do. I'm not sure because uh, it's, it's a short gameplay down one. I'm sure they might have shown stuff that I didn't see. But from what I saw from skimming around, like it just looked like a desert area with a lot of monsters, which I wasn't a big fan of. I vastly much prefer like the trails method where like the way their monsters are is be pretty much between towns and between towns you have a lot of paths to kind of go through and explore to get to towns. It's less open areas and more like specific valleys and paths you get to explore so again this game could have that i'm literally basing it off the one area i saw but if it just is a big open area i'm not really a fan of that uh, which is just something i noticed but yeah after the that area you got to a town and the town looked fucking fantastic to me it looked like a pretty much standard medieval town with like every building's made out of stone and it's kind of like um oldy feeling with knights and stuff and i really liked it visually and it was very like bustling you could like see all around the screen chat bubbles were showing up with what people were saying you can see like around people there were like uh, ui indicators to show that they're talking so i really liked how busy it was and it really seems like uh, you can talk to people hopefully i usually like that about uh, i usually like that in jrpgs when you can talk to people so it looked like it was very bustling so we'll see how that is when uh, the game comes out but the town i liked they showed the entire map they showed that you can go and fast travel to other parts of the map and uh, when you're fast traveling what's interesting is i'm not sure if this is a force thing hopefully it's not a force thing but they pretty much showed and they said that usually when you fast travel in games it's instant but in this it pretty much takes you into your ship called the runner i believe and in the runner you pretty much get to hang out while you're going to the town i believe that's that's pretty much what i took from it i'm not sure if that's perfectly right that's from what i can tell that's how it works and Again, hopefully that is enforced. I wouldn't be a fan if there actually is no like proper fast travel where you can just skip. But I really love the ship's design. Like it looks really cool. It's very, very steampunky with a lot of pipes and metal and like rivets and steampunkiness. Like I really liked how the ship looks. So design wise, I really loved it. There were some character shilling where you can get to talk to them. And so I'm assuming there can be some plot stuff there. Hopefully it is more like plot oriented because Trails does this thing like they have this thing uh, in Trails 1, Trails of Cold Steel 1, where when you had to go to uh, certain locations for the first time, there was a train ride, and you pretty much just got to be in the train, talk to some NPCs, and like play cards with them, and you can end it whenever you want and just get there. That's kind of different because that's like a story-based thing. It's not like it was, it happened every time you fast travel, so there were cool details that you, can, uh, that you could uh, get out of that. I'm not sure if that's the same for Metaphor, but if it is like Trails where like you, you could actually talk to people and get some cool plot-related things, that would be dope. But I'm not really too confident in that because if you're in this area every single time you fast travel, you probably want to be getting new information every time you fast travel. So we'll see how that is. But I like the design, not really sold on the mechanic of needing to hang out every time you fast travel. But yeah, another thing I noticed in the city was uh, there was a thing called a gauntlet runner, where you can, which you can use to travel, which uh, visually it looked like a stick like a very like short broomstick maybe like a foot long that the character stands on and uh he pretty much just rides it like a skateboard around town and so that's kind of cool like i saw it kind of reminded me of kingdom hearts 2 with the rocks when he skateboarded around so that's one way you can go around um in terms of combat so there was some combat they explained and i mentioned last week where i was very interested to see like how the combat works in terms of like when is it real time when is it turn-based because they kind of showed a bit about that 
And from what I can tell from the gameplay demo, it does seem pretty much exactly what I mentioned last week about how it works in Trails, where, like, you can pretty much kill enemies immediately if they're a lot weaker than you, which is just like how Trails works, and it doesn't go into a turn-based state. And if they are stronger, you can hit them a few times, and then it actually goes into a proper turn-based battle. So that's kind of what I noticed. And the combat is pretty much, um, uh, like, a standard turn-based combat. I'm assuming it's a lot like Persona. I'm not really familiar with Persona. But one thing that I thought was interesting, and I, this reminded, a, reminded me a bit about Persona, which uh is that you can transform into like this monster like state so they showed some characters transforming into like what look like the enemies which kind of reminds me i think persona you can maybe do something similar like that you i think you can summon personas to help you and so yeah i believe they called it archetypes you're able to transform into them and you can become these monsters and then fight as them too so that i think that was one of the main things they were showing with the combat that i noticed and i think that was pretty much what i took away from the 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 showcase i'm just looking at my notes but yeah i, I just like i pretty much looked at i focused on the visual style the combat how the combat work and anything other else i was cool like the fast travel and the kind of gauntlet runner traveling but yeah that's pretty much what i got out of the metaphor refantasio showcase if you're interested in it just search metaphor refantasio showcase you'll see it it literally happened a day or two ago and so yeah th i'm still excited about the game again i'll see whether i get it right away probably not right away i i rarely ever pay full price for games because it's so expensive here and so if there's a demo that comes out i would love to play it i still want to play this stellar blade demo to see if i really like that in those stellar blades is coming out very soon but yeah that was the last uh, new story and from here we'll go on to the next segment which is jrpgs that are releasing this week now for this week of jrpgs that are releasing this week there are so many jrpgs well, it's, it's funny because usually there's like about maybe um three or four jrpgs that are released in a week and last week there were zero jrpgs and the last couple of weeks have been kind of empty in terms of jrpgs that are releasing but uh, this week we have one two three four five six seven eight jrpgs and like always i get these from icicledisaster.com and rpgsite.net so that's where I, what i'm going to be talking about and so yeah let's just get started so i'm going to be talking about games that are releasing of this week so from april 21st to april 27th so first of all is april 23rd so this is a game that came out yesterday and this is ayudin chronicles 100 heroes this is a game that i've heard about it's coming out on ps5 ps4 for xbox series x series switch xbox one and pc and i took a look into it this looks pretty much like a classic jrpg the characters are sprites the environment is uh, is 3d it looks very much like a like a ps3 era jrpg but it looks cool honestly and i remember this is i believe this is a game that i also have in my ps5 wish list like um a game from the series it wasn't this one but yeah it looks really good i'm not gonna go too deep into all these games because there's so many that i have to cover but iudin chronicles yeah comes out or came out on april 23rd the next game that comes out tomorrow on april 25th is a megaton musashi w wired this is a game that i actually have already talking about um in a previous episode it is this pretty much mecha game and i talked about how i really like the mecha designs where they're a bit more cartoony looking than gundams but i thought they were very original and looked very cool i mentioned that the gameplay wasn't really to my taste i'm looking at some gameplay right now where it looks kind of it looks kind of like how mecha games usually look like they're not like really my thing but yeah if you're interested in mecha games mechaton musashi wired uh yeah it's coming out tomorrow april 25th on ps5 ps4 switch and pc and we have another game coming out on april 25th which is saga emerald beyond coming out on ps5 ps4 switch pc ios and ios and android what it's coming out on ios and android what the hell so I've talked about this game, I believe, last episode or a couple of episodes too. This is like a full ass, looks like a modern JRPG, full 3D. I did not know it was coming out on iOS and Android. That is surprising to me. But yeah, I've already talked about this in past episodes. I don't know much about it, but it is um, a game that looks interesting. And I believe a demo did release recently too. So if you're interested in checking that out, you can coming out on April 25th. A game that is coming out on April 26th on the PS5 is Stellar Blade. I already talked about this game in the past too, but it is a Korean made game, which looks really fucking cool. Visually, it looks good. I really like how the combat looks and, it's some, and there's a demo out for it too if you want to try it out. It is only on play so it's on the ps5 but that is a game that is coming out on april 26th another game coming out on april 26th which is also a game that i've already talked about that i want to try which is sandland it's coming out on ps5 ps4 xbox series series and uh pc and this is um obviously the game uh designed by akira toriyama this is based on one of his uh, manga uh i believe they have a movie coming out or that's come out already and so this is kind of like the game version of that i assume i mentioned this but visually it looks amazing i played the demo for like 20 minutes and i thought it was cool um it's not my type of style where it's mostly vehicle combat there is some like hand-to-hand -hand combat too but again this is a game that i said that i'd probably try once like it's on sale or something because visually it looks like amazingly like, probably one of the one of the best games i've seen visually because it's so it's stylized so nice in a Kira Toriyama style but 
That is a game that is coming out on April 26th. And the last three games, I'm just going to say them all at once, all coming out on April 26th, and they're all from the Class of Heroes series. So on the PS5 and Switch are Class of Heroes 1 and 2 Complete Edition, and on PC on the 26th of April, you have Class of Heroes Anniversary Edition and Class of Heroes 2G Remastered. And based on what I see from Steam... For Class of Heroes 1 and 2 Complete Edition, it is pretty much like a classic looking JRPG. It's a type of gameplay where like uh, when you're in battles, it's in first person. So it's like that type of JRPG, which I, I don't know what the name of that is. I've noticed that in like older JRPGs where like you don't see yourself in first person. You, see, you usually have like three enemies on the screen and you fight them. It looks like that type of game. Uh, but I've never tried it. It's very anime looking. But yeah, that is um, also coming out on April 26th along with... A lot of other games from that series. It's very classic looking. Like the the sprites are very anime like, and it's the type of battle style, as I talked about. But yeah, <laughs> those are all the games that are coming out uh, this week. A lot of games. Very surprised that Stellar Blade and Sandlot are coming out on the same day because I've literally have had segments dedicated to each of them, saying how I'm very excited to play them. Um, so yeah, those are all the games that are releasing this week. And from here, we'll move on to the next segment, which is a JRPG mechanic that I think is dope. Now for this week, what JRPG mechanic do I want to talk about? I kind of want to rename this segment because I I. Even though I call it JRPG mechanic, they're not like really mechanics that I talk about sometimes. Like sometimes it's like story tropes, sometimes it's like character type things. And in this time it's like an aspect of JRPGs that I've noticed. But when I talk what I want to talk about this week is polish in JRPGs and how like usually for the JRPGs I play, they usually come out a lot more polished than like some other games that I've played. And I want to say the number one reason behind that is because it's a JRPG, as in it's a game that came out in Japan. And usually how most JRPGs work is that they come out in Japan first and like some point later they come to the West and because of that, the games obviously have a chance to become more polished because we're technically not getting them at launch from when they were uh, being finished developing. So yeah, I just really appreciate that. Like I'm trying to think like I can't legitimately think about any JRPG that I've played that has been buggy really. Because, like, the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours I put in JRPGs, I mostly play Trails. I've never, I think, encountered a bug in Trails. There's been some, like, uh, localization iffiness, like uh, Trails into Reverie, which is, like, the newest one. There was, like, typos in the localization. That's one thing, and that that makes sense because, like, it localized, so, like, there's some bugs with that, obviously. But in terms of actual game pay, gameplay or visuals, I haven't had any bugs. The only ones I can really think about, which is, um, one is Final Fantasy VII Remake. I know there was, like, a huge thing that came out where, like, apparently visually people were complaining, where, like, they'd be popping. I personally never experienced that. I, I thought people were crazy. I thought the game looked fine, and so, like, for me, it was fine. But one game-breaking bug that I did have, which is of an older game, but it was ported to PC, so that's why it broke, was, um, um, in Trolls in the Sky, it was funny because pretty much in Trolls in the Sky, you're able to do these quests, and when you finish like however many quests, you can go back to your Bracer branch, tell them what quest you finish, and you get money for it. Apparently, there was a quest where in the quest name, there was a special character that kept on crashing the game. So whenever you did that quest and you went into the branch to kind of get the money for it, the NPC would try to say the quest name and it would crash. And it was very hard for me to figure that out because I'm like, why the fuck is it crashing? And I was very lucky where I had a save, I believe, before that happened. I forgot what I did. I, I got around it in a specific way. I, I either had a save before I did that quest, so I didn't do that quest and I was fine. Or I think what I might have done is that I actually didn't have a save. And what I did was I finished enough quests where like that quest was like buried down in a list where like they wouldn't read the name specifically. And because of that, the character wouldn't show up. And because of that, I was able to get the money for it and it was fine. I think it was the second one because I remember like it take me a while to figure out how to get past that bug. But yeah, I was from Trolls in the Sky and it was just a PC version because I'm showing there was something weird with the PC version because I had already played the game on the PSP in the past and it was fine there. So yeah, that was like the only JRPG bug and that's a very specific like port bug which like isn't really specific to JRPGs but when I think about like Trails games Kingdom Hearts games Final Fantasy games I legitimately cannot think of any like legit bug that I've experienced like the only like modern game that I can think of that I've had like proper bugs in was like Spider-Man 2 that had like a lot of like bugs where I like literally had to restart the game or there'd be very weird visual bugs where like I'm riding a bicycle with Peter Parker and he just starts glitching through the ground or Miles Morales is literally having a seizure on the street or like bugs were like I honestly have never noticed in a JRPG so yeah I just really want to talk about how like I personally from my experience have noticed that JRPGs have been more polished and you just see this with like games like Genshin Impact or games like that like the the game I talked about earlier in the episode Wuthering Waves like that game looks polished not just from like a gameplay perspective but like from a sound mixing perspective, a sound effect perspective, visual perspective, uh, performance perspective, that's actually very important too because 
I don't think I've played a JRPG where it like runs like shit, honestly. Like personally, because what I like about JRPGs is unlike Western games, they don't really strive for realism because Western games usually try to get that realistic look and they try to go for like a visual look that really impresses everyone. Where like JRPGs don't do that. They usually try to stylize and like my favorite game series trails, they look fine. Like up until recently, they straight up look like PS3 level JRPGs and I I fucking I don't care. I thought it was fine. And because of that, they run well. Like they always run like at 60 FPS smooth, there's like never drops and so like i like that about jrpgs that adds with the polishness because like you're never getting a jrpg that runs like shit now is that always true of course not we'll see with stellar blade how that is i know technically that's not a jrpg but like that is a game that is like a lot more like better looking than like traditional jrpgs so maybe that game will run like shit i'm not sure but like at least from my experience from the jrpgs i play they usually perform very well um uh, the sound mixing is usually really good and like especially like the genshin impact type games their sound design is really fucking good like i have like specific memories of playing honkai star rail where like i would attack and they have like these very good like cinematic sound effects that happen when you use moves it's very cool and so yeah just like paul in every sense of the word from gameplay visual sound i really appreciate jrpgs and i believe that is pretty much it because yeah i'm just I'm, I'm trying to think of specific examples that i can give like where i've experienced bugs i don't think i can even like kingdom hearts which like i've played throughout my life through a lot of games i don't think i've experienced bugs the only game i'll probably experience bugs in is in like kingdom hearts 3 since that's more of a modern game but like i'm trying to think i don't at least i don't remember any bug that i experienced from that so yeah, JRPGs and polish, that's just something that I personally noticed. And if you did too, let me know down in the comments below. But uh, yeah, I just really want to talk about that. And from here on, we'll go on to the last segment before we end the podcast, which is the JRPG top casual list. And this is the final segment of Spill the Tear, where I talk about some kind of JRPG top casual list. And pretty much what I do is I think of some kind of top list and I kind of casually give my list like right at the top because it's not something I think too hard about, but something that I just kind of think of at the top of my head. And this week, just to kind of theme in with this episode, I thought the list would be the top anime styled games because we talked about Wuthering Waves and like uh, games like that and we talked a bit about um, a Metaphor Re Fantasio which is kind of anime-ish too. I thought it'd be fun to think about games that are anime styled and I feel like there are games that are specifically anime styled. I feel like on one end is like Genshin Impact which is like very much like anime and on the far end which I honestly wouldn't even consider anime is like Kingdom Hearts. I think visually Kingdom Hearts is not like anime at all. Like when I'm playing that I don't think of it as an anime game where when I play Genshin Impact I'm like yeah this is, this is an anime game. So I I thought I would give my top three uh, from those. So let's start with... Actually, let me just give you my top three list. At number three, I have Genshin Impact. At number two, I have Honkai Star Rail. And at number one, I have Trails. And um, I don't really have, like, some games you might expect. Like, I don't have East. Even though East technically can be considered an anime game if you look at the 2D art, it is usually an anime. But I think that the main thing is when I'm playing East. I don't ever think of it as an anime, just like from the gameplay perspective and like what I experienced in the story and how characters look, I never think about it as an anime, whereas Trails, which is I put at number one on my list, Trails is interesting because I also do not consider that an anime when I'm playing really, but I can I can see it is it is anime, like the, the, from the way a lot of characters look, the way there's a lot of anime tropes in it, like when you're playing, there will be a lot of moments where you're like, okay, I can see this being like anime-ish, but I would say Trails is just like on the line where like it's not too anime, and I can also see some people saying like it's not, like it's not that anime either so um at number two we had honkai star rail honkai star rail is like genshin where like it is very anime inspired and the reason i have it above genshin impact is because i just like, i just enjoyed the game more i didn't get to play too much into it because i played it on my phone uh they fucked up and chose the wrong region for me i chose north america they forced me to europe and i didn't know and so because of that i can't play it on the playstation because i would have to start a new game i couldn't really friend people i wanted to because they were on north america and i wasn't allowed so um i i'm gonna play at some point maybe but because they fucked up my server i just don't feel like restarting the game but yeah honkai star was number two but i did enjoy it and at number three i've genshin impact and honestly the only reason this is on the list is because i didn't enjoy genshin impact but I legitimately cannot think of another anime style game that I've played because I, I play like some JRPGs. I don't play too much, but like Final Fantasy, I wouldn't consider an anime style game. Kingdom Hearts, I wouldn't consider Trails already on the list. East, I don't really consider an anime style game. And so Genshin Impact is one that I enjoyed. It was clearly anime style. So I thought it would fit as number three because I literally cannot think of anything else. But yeah, number three, I had Genshin Impact. Number two, I have Honkai Star Rail. And at number one, I have the Trail series. If I had to be specific, Trails of Cold Steel, I enjoy that more. But yeah, that is gonna end episode 12 of Spill the Tear Roll. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Thankfully, it wasn't as long as I thought because I kind of like rushed through as much as I could. Not rush as in like I missed any points, but I didn't want to like stay on any segment too long because I feel like the sweet spot for this podcast is like 
40 to 50 minutes especially as a solo podcast usually i like podcasts to be like an hour and a half like at least but that's when like there's like a group of people but since this podcast is only me for now i don't think you want to hear me for that long so 40 to 50 minutes i think is something where like if someone's on youtube they're like you know what let me try that shit let me taste that shit so yeah that was episode 12 hopefully you enjoyed it if you have any comments on anything i talked about let me know down in the comments below if you're new to this consider subscribing if you don't want to see my face i have this podcast on audio services you can find it in my youtube description or you can search spill the tiro on any audio service hopefully and yeah that will be it hopefully you enjoy this episode of spill the tiro hope to see you in episode 13 peace